At this point in the prototyping stage of the Telephone Central office, I started putting together a schematic of what I have going on with the breadboard, but I've also been changing my plans a little, so I may switch from an ESP8266 to an ESP32, and there's some other things that are problematic in terms of a finalized design, but it may be okay for bench testing and especially software development, as long as it works on the workbench, I decided it's still valuable to go ahead and make a PCB with the ESP8266 as it is now, and then refine the design later. For one thing, all of these separate modules on the breadboard with the DuPont wires are creating a fragile environment, so I've already had the experience where something stops working and I have to nudge everything around, but also I need two of these setups so each one has a phone connected to it, and I can't imagine the struggles setting up two of these breadboard messes. And so for that alone, if I can get 10 boards for $5, obviously plus the parts to go on the boards, I can just consider that a research and development cost. And all of the main components like the Wemos module and the ICs, they're going to be socketed, so I can just remove those and reuse them. And anything else like phone jacks or transformers, relays, those can easily be desoldered later. So let's start looking at the design I did come up with for now and why I want to change it. One reason I may want to not use the ESP8266 long term, since I'm using Mozzie to generate my DTMF call progress tones by playing back synthesized sine wave tones, we can also play back audio samples so we can take something like a WAV file and convert it into a data table and just play that back with Mozzie. So to help make the telephone simulator experience more authentic, we could play back sampled audio from for example, those messages, please hang up and try your call again, this is a recording, things like that. We could use Mozzie to play that when appropriate into the phone line. But on the ESP8266, audio recordings like that being several seconds long, and there's multiple of them, they can't fit in RAM. So normally we could just put them in flash program memory and have them played from there. But the way it works on ESP8266, it's too slow to work. So I'm wondering if I switch over to an ESP32 module of some sort, maybe that will let me play back recordings from program memory. It's not a requirement, but it's a nice to have. And also because there may be a lot more available GPIO, which I'd also have to double check, since I'm using the Wemos D1 Mini for the ESP8266, there's only so many GPIO, and I'm using the I2C external GPIO expander for now, but there's a few problems with that as well. So let's just take a look at the schematic of the system I have as it is now. The schematic is three pages, so for now, just an overview. I'm currently powering the whole board from 5 volts on the USB cable, and here's the limited number of GPIO available. So I'm taking the serial clock and data, bringing those over to the PCF8574 GPIO expander, and then I'm turning that into eight more GPIO. So let's get these two circuit blocks out of the way. Those are the other two pages on the schematic. We have the phone slick module that controls the actual phone. And then we have our MT8870 DTMF decoder. So if we look at the DTMF decoder, we've seen this before on the separate breakout module I made. So it takes five volts, looks at the audio, on the phone line, and when there's DTMF buttons pressed, it will make the data available so we can read it. But the way I'm using this stuff right now, this needing a 5 volt supply, the datasheet for the chip says it wants the supply voltage to be at least 4.75 volts, so it's really strict on having 5 volts. And since I'm using the USB 5 volts out of this Wemos module, it goes through a diode, so I'm already going to be below 5 volts. And especially in this system, it's got several hundred milliamps of current draw, worst case, with the telephone module. So I start out measuring maybe 4.4 to 4.5 volts that I'm working with. So I'm technically running the DTMF decoder 
out of spec, but it is working. So for just a development test platform on the workbench, as long as it's running, I can still use this to develop software and make sure everything runs. And here is the phone line slick module. It's the same basic design as the separate slick module breakout board I had done. And I'm currently running this at 5 volts from USB as well, even though this module says it can work down to 3.3 volts. So I may actually want to try 3.3 volts because of the digital input and output signals, depending what I'm doing. So going back to the main schematic page, running the module at 5 volts, the I.O. pins are at 5 volts, and the GPIO expander I'm running at 5 volts. So the main reason this is all set up at 5 volts is because the DTMF decoder has to be 5 volts. So this GPIO expander had to be 5 volts, and that meant this had to be 5 volts. But if I get rid of the ESP8266 and go with an ESP32, if I run this module at 3.3, I should be able to connect these I.O. straight to the ESP32. And for the DTMF decoder, maybe I can just use discrete FET level shifters to go from 5 volts here down to 3.3 and send it straight to the ESP32 if I don't need a GPIO expander anymore because there's a lot of pins. And while we're looking at the GPIO expander, another problem is mixed voltages here because the serial clock and data need to be pulled up to either 3.3 or 5 in this system. The I.O. on the ESP8266 are 3.3 volt. And I don't like the idea of assuming these I.O. are 5 volt tolerant. If they were, for sure, then I could have just pulled up serial clock and data to 5 volts, and then all of this would have been compatible. I can't see anything in the ESP8266 datasheet, at least the last time I looked. I didn't see anything saying it's 5 volt tolerant, but when you Google it, you see stuff including references to Facebook where it was stated that it is tolerant, and then people say, oh, the protection diodes on the pins may need a current limit resistor, and it just didn't sound like a solid confirmation for me. So I'd rather keep serial clock and data at 3.3 volts on the workbench. It's running, but I wouldn't want to leave it like this. I should probably put level shifting FETs again here. But the way it works out, if my 5 volt supply is actually starting out around 4.5 due to the diode drop, the GPIO expander guaranteed logic high input is 0.7 times the supply voltage. So if we say 4.5, we need to see 3.15 volts being received as a logic high. And we're pulling up to 3.3, so there's not too much margin there, but it does technically work. So it's not a good way to do a final proper design. But again, I'm only calling this a prototype for software development and workbench testing. And so considering I may end up not even using a GPIO expander, and I may not use the ESP8266, I didn't want to keep hacking on extra stuff here. So I'm sort of in a design limbo prototype phase right now. So I'm going to go ahead and actually order some PCBs and assemble this because it's just going to make things a lot easier going forward, especially seeing the erratic behavior on a breadboard and having to have two of these systems up and running to make the whole thing work eventually. I think it's worth the cost and just try and reuse whatever parts I can when I declare the boards obsolete. So if somebody wants to go ahead and make this based on this design, it may work as well, but it's not the final design. So let's look at, again, just as a reminder, what we're doing. Each of these boards is meant to represent a central office, which handles interfacing with a phone, both to control it and make it ring, and also to play the tones in so you know what's happening when you're making a call, and to ultimately connect you up with another phone. So to do that, the central office needs a way to get connected with another central office, which does the same interactions with another phone, assuming they're not all close to each other and they can all just be directly connected from one central office. The system I'm emulating is 
using a dedicated central office, assuming both phones are far away from each other geographically. So I'm not sure the terminology, but I think this is a trunk line going between central offices. So up until now, I've had the central office interacting with the phone. I've made it ring. I've generated tones into the phone so when it's picked up, you can hear what's going on. And I've detected DTMF button presses on the phone. So the only thing really left to try out is establishing this trunk line to another PCB or breadboard setup. And that's where it just started getting too complicated on the breadboard and I'd rather just have an actual at least one PCB assembled and one breadboard circuit since I already have it set up. And I can try actually getting two phones working together instead of just interacting with the one. So that's where this schematic has evolved. This center of the schematic here is basically what we have on the breadboard. The phone plugs into this slick module and through the GPIO expander, the ESP8266 can tell when we pick up the phone and we need to do something like play audio tones into it, or if we're receiving DTMF button presses, that audio needs to be detected and decoded with this MT8870 block all through the GPIO expander over to the ESP8266. And up until now, when generating these call progress tones with Mozzie out into the phone line, I've just been playing it on a speaker. And that speaker was connected here with the Mozzie audio output. But now, with a schematic like this, I can just take that audio and buffer it with an op amp and send it into the audio path of the phone line based on the slick module having an audio in and an audio out path. And similarly, I can take any audio happening on the phone line, send it out and buffer it and put it into this DTMF decoder. So I no longer have to have a transformer coupling this directly across the tip and ring like I've been doing on the breadboard. It should all work smoothly like this. So for these op amps, right now they're just set with a gain of negative one. So it's just inverting the signal and it's not amplifying or attenuating. And with a 10K feedback resistor and a 2.2 nano capacitor, we can pass audio frequencies that the phone line is expected to have while getting rid of high frequencies that may cause us some issues. Because we only need a certain bandwidth for telephone line audio anyway, and if there's any digital noise artifacts from this PWM audio, it's best to clean it all up. And since we're using a single supply op amp, we need to bias the signal up so that the audio can pass through without clipping down near the bottom rail. So I decided to bias this about halfway up to the 3.3 volt rail. That should give enough headroom for these audio signals and prevent clipping. And so I've got filter capacitors here to help try and keep this as clean and steady as possible. And I have an LED to show when power is going to be received by the circuit. And there's a ring indicator LED on this GPIO so that when we are using the slick module to make the phone ring, we can also just see it as a confirmation here. And up here on the top of the schematic, we have another phone jack and we have this RS-485 transceiver. So going back to this central office interconnection trunk line, that's meant to represent that. So we would have this extra phone line going between and an RS-485 link. So what we can do is use RS-485 so that the central offices can communicate to each other to say somebody is trying to call someone else and communicate back whether that line is available to call or if it's busy or any other status. And when they do coordinate, then we use the extra telephone jack to create the audio pathway between the two phones finally. So let's say in the existing setup where I'm picking up the phone, getting a dial tone, and then dialing a number, if that's a valid phone number for the phone hooked up on a duplicate setup like this, which is a different central office, the module can talk over RS-45 to the other central office and say, somebody wants to call that number, are you available? And if not, now we can use Mozzie to generate the busy tone in our phone so we know we can't call. 
If we are able to complete the call, we turn on this relay here to route the call. And what we're doing is using a transformer, 600 ohm to 600 ohm impedance matching. And this would be the trunk line to the other central office. So that gets put in parallel across the tip and ring here. So now the phone that's picked up here has its local loop current so it will operate. And now we're basically tapping in just to send and receive audio into this local system. And there's a series DC block capacitor because I only at this point need to send audio both ways. And hopefully that will work okay. If not, I'll have some more figuring out to do. But again, this is all prototyping. And part of the purpose here is I'm learning as I go with this. I'm not just putting together something that I already fully know how to do. So I'll keep working on this. I'm going to get prototype boards with this circuit as is. I already know it's not the final circuit, so I don't mind having extra unanticipated issues. I'll deal with those as they arise.